We're very pleased to be joined today by EEOC Commissioner Keith Sunderling. As a sitting commissioner, Mr. Sunderling has a unique perspective on EEOC priorities, new initiatives, and the changing makeup of the commission. Epstein Becker Green's David Garland sat down with Commissioner Sunderling to ask what employers should expect in 2021. So Commissioner Sunderling, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. You joined the commission at Toward the end of last year, uh, the election occurred and we had a new administration. As a consequence, the, the, the new president appoints the new chair and new vice chair. Uh, but even though we have a new administration, we still have a Republican majority on the commission. Are there specific areas where we can expect to see a, a bipartisan solutions, bipartisan uh, initiatives? I believe that all five commissioners strongly believe in the agency's mission, which is to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and eradicate discrimination from the workplace. So knowing that, that we all five were confirmed by the Senate, we all five are passionate about this uh, agency and, and its, its wonderful mission, I do think we'll be able to do a lot together. For me personally, what I'm hopeful is that the EEOC continues to be a very transparent including giving unprecedented access and disclosure to our systemic program, our commissioner charges, our directed investigations, and the continuation of vote posting. And then all the commission's votes have been uh, placed on our website so anyone can come and see how each individual votes. Uh, commissioner, another area uh, within the EEOC's uh, purview that's of interest to employers and employees is, is the conciliation uh, process. Uh, what, what can you share with us about that process uh, here at the beginning of 2021? Well, there were some significant changes to the conciliation process uh, by a new rule that came out in January and that became effective uh, last month in February. So the new rule directly addresses a disconnect that can occur during this conciliation process. Namely, the commission may make a demand on an employer and not fully explain or provide the support for the commission's position. In turn, the employer cannot properly evaluate the merits of the commission's demand and evaluate the demand against the risk for potential litigation. So this disconnect, we found, makes it less likely that conciliations will succeed. If conciliations don't succeed, then potentially lengthy and costly litigations may occur. So this final rule, I believe, will be a catalyst for better communication between the commission and the employer, which will help the parties narrow the issues, manage expectations, and hopefully conclude the matter without the need for that costly and protracted litigation. How do you expect that to actually to be implemented in the field, in the, in the, in the district offices, in the regional offices? To me, one of the most important parts is to provide the employer at least 14 calendar days to respond to the EEOC's initial conciliation proposal. So that 14-day period is critical, in my opinion, because it allows employers to make decisions about what their liability is, to see exactly what it is. We're hopeful with this additional information that the employer will receive, that they'll be able to take it all in, understand their liability, which uh, may be serious, and also have some time to think about it and come back and hopefully resolve the matter. Another area where we've seen change uh, more recently is in the uh, uh, delegation of litigation decision making. Uh, Commissioner, can, can you explain to us and take us through some of those changes? The EEOC has limited resources. The cho choice about which case to litigate out of thousands and thousands of charges filed with the agencies each year speaks volumes to the EEOC's priorities and its commitment to the legal arguments it urges the courts to adopt. Pursuant to the new litigation authority that's operating for all litigations as of January 13th, commissioners, by default, will vote on the following cases, and that's cases involving allegations of systemic discrimination or pattern or practice discrimination, cases expected to involve a major expenditure of agency resources, cases presenting issues on which the commission has taken a position contrary to precedent in the circuit in which the case was filed, and then any other case that may implicate areas of the law that are not settled or cases that are likely to generate public controversy. Well, let's let's talk about the, the subject of, of compliance and, and, and specifically what, what is the EEOC doing now uh, that really will assist uh, employers uh, in, in complying with the civil rights statutes. The EEOC uh, the past year put out three significant guidance documents. Um, the first one was about the opioid uh, pandemic going on and addiction 
for uh, people who are suffer from opioid addiction, which is very significant. The other ones relates to our uh, nation's veterans. This document it was updated regarding the uh, ADA and the intersection between the ADA and the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act that employers also have to deal with who hire veterans. The other um, guidance document we updated was uh, on religious discrimination. It was the first time this document was updated in 12 years. I'm very proud of these three uh, documents, I believe. You know, in the compliance assistance realm, it will really help not only employees understand their rights, but help employers comply with that, because I, I truly believe in these areas that employers do want to help. Thanks, David and Commissioner Sunderling. You can listen to an extended podcast of this conversation at employmentlawthisweek.com or on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.